Well, today we begin a brand new series, and we're going to continue it through the summer, uh, and it's called Stories from Jesus. And what we're going to do over the next several weeks is we are going to look at some stories or parables that Jesus told, and we're taking them all from the gospel of Matthew. And so we're going to be looking at these stories and finding out what was it that Jesus taught What was it that he was saying? Now, it's very important that you understand this. These stories that Jesus told, these parables, it's not like Aesop's fables. You know what I'm talking about? Aesop's fables, the tortoise and the hare, and stories like that. You know, they all have a moral to them, and it's a very good moral. But Jesus did not just teach about moralism. It's very important that you understand this. Jesus was not talking to people so that they could be a better person. He did not come so that we could turn over a new leaf. Jesus came to bring dead things to life. He came to redeem us through a relationship with the Heavenly Father. He came to bring us back into that relationship. And and as you're going to see today, the story that we're going to talk about today is really, uh, it's rooted in faith. And without faith, it is impossible to please God, the Bible tells us in the, in the book of Hebrews. So um, what is it that we're looking at? Well, we're really looking at the importance of faith in this story that we're talking about today. Um, when I was in high school, uh, I played basketball, and our basketball team did a lot of things together. My dad was actually our coach, and so we spent a lot of times, we do things like we go camping together, uh, team building, they call it now. Um, one thing that we did, which was a lot of fun, is uh, we went swimming in this river where I grew up. I grew up in North Carolina and uh, out in the country. And so um, I remember that we would go out and that we would, uh, we would jump off of this place called the Rock House. Now, if you've been here very long, you've probably heard me tell this story before, Um, but the Rock House was very famous in where I lived. In fact, maybe a better word would be infamous, okay? Because the Rock House, it was a swimming hole. It It was in a big river there in the mountains of North Carolina, but it was infamous in that the Rock House, it was literally this big rock cliff, and uh, there was a spot that uh, was close to the water that you could jump off of. It was probably about 10 feet high. And that was a lot of fun, jumping from 10 feet into the river. But there was a cave. The the reason it was called the Rock House because it was a giant rock cliff. And there was a cave right through the middle of it. And so, uh, therefore, it was called the Rock House. And so, we would get up on the 10-foot spot, and we would jump, and we would have fun. If you were really brave... You did what a lot of people did. You climbed up on that 10-foot rock, and then you continued to climb up the face of the rock until you came to this cave, and you would crawl through, and it would come out on top of the cliff. It was really, really high, probably about 40 feet above the river. Now, I don't know if you've ever been 40 feet above the river, but it's pretty high when you're looking down especially when you're not really sure what's in the water down below you. And so uh, I'll never forget this. We were there. uh, I was a sophomore in high school, and uh, our whole team was there. We were swimming. We were having a good time. And then uh, I don't know whose idea it was, but we decided that we were going to get out of the river. We were going to climb up on the 10-foot ledge. We were going to climb up the face of the rock, go through the rock house, the cave, and come out on top of the rock house. And we got up there and we looked down and it was daunting to say the least. It was scary. It was intimidating. It was really, really high above the water. And as you can imagine, young boys, teenage boys, we all were bragging about how brave we were. We're bragging about who's going to jump first and who's going to do the most flips and who's going to dive. And we're, we're talking all kinds of nonsense as we stood on the edge of a cliff 40 feet above the water. 
And all of a sudden, a guy named Rodney, he was a good friend of mine, Rodney looked around at everybody. We were talking about who's going to go first. And, and really, we were just delaying because you know what? We talked a good game. We said we were brave enough. We said that we were going to jump, but we weren't planning on doing it. It was too high. It was too far down. It was too much. And all of a sudden, Rodney, he piped up and he said, I'll go. And we were like, yeah, Rodney's not quite all there. So, you know, we're not sure if he's going to go or not. And all of a sudden, he backs up and he starts to run. And we're thinking at any second, he's going to stop. At any second, he's going to get close to the edge and he's going to go, psych. I'm not sure if we said psych back then or not, but uh, he, would, he was going to, you know, just uh, fake us out. And sure enough, Rodney got closer and closer and he was still running at top speed. He got all the way to the edge and we expected him to stop, but he did not. And Rodney got to the edge of the cliff and he pushed off and he began to jump. And his arms began to flail. And his legs went all kinds of directions. We started praying. Rodney, it was good to know you, son. All right. We'll see you in heaven one day, we hope. Uh, You know, Rodney's screaming as he's falling down toward the river. Ah! And he hit the surface of the water. And there was an incredible splash. And he went under the water. And we waited, and we waited, and we waited. And we were like, yeah, sure enough, that was dumb of him to jump, you know. He shouldn't have jumped. And all of a sudden, his head broke the surface of the water, and he began to scream at the top of his lungs, that was awesome! And then the rest of us, we lined up, and we started running, and we jumped, And we'd go, ah, all the way down. And we'd hit the water. And we began to do it again and again and again as we had a blast. The time of our lives as sophomores in high school. Now, I I, want to point out something to you. We talked a good game. We said we were brave enough to jump. We were convinced in our minds that we could do it. We were afraid. But our faith, listen closely, did not become faith until we jumped. It's one thing to say you got faith when you're standing far back from the ledge of the cliff. And it's another thing to leap through the air And go down to the surface of the water. Well, today, the story I'm going to talk to you really is about that kind of faith. It's one thing to say that you've got faith in God. It's one thing to say that you have a relationship with Jesus Christ. It's one thing to say that you believe the Bible, that you believe what the Bible teaches about having a relationship with God. But it's another thing completely to act upon it. And so that's what we're going to be looking at today. And and the story is a very famous story that Jesus told. It's in Matthew chapter 7 and verses 24 through 27. And here's what Jesus told. Now, you need to understand, he's telling this. This is like his closing illustration. He had been preaching what we refer to as the Sermon on the Mount. The first part of it we call the Beatitudes. And, And if you read in Matthew 5 six and seven, that's all really a part of that sermon. And Matthew recorded it for us. And I'm not sure that it was every word that Jesus said, but he recorded these words. And every one of these words is something that Jesus said. And we see that this sermon, I believe, was the greatest sermon preached in the history of the world. And, And so Jesus is giving a closing illustration He's saying, if you really want to put into practice what I've been talking about, listen to this. So let's pick up Jesus' closing illustration. 
He said, everyone then who hears these words of mine. Now, what was he talking about? The words of this little story? No. He was talking about the Sermon on the Mount. And I'm going to explain that to you in just a minute. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does them. There's a caveat there. It's not just saying you believe. It's acting on it. It's doing something about it. He said, everyone that hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. He built it on a solid foundation. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house. But it did not fall. Why? Because of the building material? Because of the awesomeness of the builder? No. Here's the key. Because it was founded on the rock. The foundation is what made the difference. Then he goes on. And everyone who hears these words of mine, what he talked about in the Beatitudes and in the Sermon on the Mount, everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them, a contrast. One group does, one group does not. Everyone that hears and doesn't do them will be like a foolish man. Do you see what he's saying? Those that do, those that don't. Those that hear, those that reject, those that are wise, those that are foolish. You get the idea that he's making a comparison here? Okay. He says, everyone who does not, who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on sand. Everybody knows you cannot build a house on sand you got to have a strong foundation. And notice what happened to this because it was the same in both cases. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell. Now, he goes on and says something incredibly, incredibly important to this story. It seems like a little bit of a throwaway line, but it is not. He says, and great was the fall of it. Tragic. It was incredible. It was enormous. It was epic. The fall that happened because of the foundation that it was built on. Now, I want to give you today just three words, and I won't be too long today. I want to give you three words that I want to explain that I believe we can extract from this story and that will help us understand exactly what Jesus was talking about. The first word, I've already mentioned it, is the word faith. Faith. Now, you remember when I said that you can have faith when you're on top of the cliff and you're not jumping? That's, yeah, I've got faith. Yeah, I'm bold. Yes. But you don't really actually have faith until you jump. So when Jesus was talking about faith here, he was talking about a particular type of faith. In fact, it's very interesting that he uses the word hear. The wise person who hears and the foolish person who hears. Now, that directs us back to a passage that was foundational to the Jewish audience that Jesus had. It's found in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 6. Verses 4 and 5. And and to the Jewish people in his audience, here's what it was known as. The great Shema. Everybody say Shema. Shema. Don't you feel smarter now that you spoke some Hebrew when you came into church today? You can leave and say, man, I'm just, my brain's getting so big and I'm learning so much. I spoke some Hebrew in church today. Shema is the word for, we translate it, the word, you ready? This is going to be about groundbreaking, the word hear. <laughs> you say, well, what's so big about that? Well, it was a particular type of hearing. It, it wasn't just like, how many have children? Raise your hand. You, you got children? Anybody ever had this conversation with a child? You go up and clean your room. It looks like a pig pen right now. Okay, mama. And they didn't do it. Anybody ever had that happen before? Okay, you know what I'm talking about? You know what? That child heard you, right? That child did hear you. They acknowledged you. They just didn't do anything about it. And you threaten them and all the stuff that you do, uh, you know, because they didn't go and clean their room. Now, let me ask this. How many have ever had this kind of conversation? And I direct this toward the women. 
Because I don't know what it is about a woman and her ability not to ask exactly what she wants, assuming that her husband will read her mind, okay? The guys, don't say amen because you got to go home with that woman today, all right? So uh, I can say this because I'm not going on home with any of your wives, all right? So, uh, but here's what, here's what a woman will say. My, I know my wife has said this before. I'm not sure what is up with the sighing, but uh, anyway, a lot of times whenever something is being asked, a sigh precedes it or follows it. It's like, I wish somebody would take out the trash. (laughs) And ladies, let me tell you what your husband is thinking when you say that. I wish somebody would take out the trash. (laughs) You see, your husband heard you. But he was watching a football game, and he's like, I hope I'll get around to it one day too, all right? See, the difference between the word uh, that Jesus was using here and the word that's used in the book of Deuteronomy is this. It's not just giving mental assent to. It's just not acknowledging, oh, yeah, I've heard that story before. It's not just knowing about God or knowing about Jesus in your mind. There are a lot of people that know about him. There are a lot of people that go to church. There are a lot of people that could tell you a story about how Jesus died on the cross and was buried and rose from the grave. They have a mental acknowledgement, if you will, about Jesus. But back in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 and 5, it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Now, that's a very odd thing to say. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. Well, what does that mean? Wouldn't it be better if he said it, the Lord is our God and he is one God, the only God? Well, in essence, that's what he was saying. But the reason he said it this way was very important. Then he says in the next verse, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your might. The idea here was that you place your faith, real faith, the kind that jumps off the cliff, the kind that actually hears and does. The kind that does more than just acknowledge a mental relationship with God, but the kind that follows through. What he was saying here is this, and it's a picture of our relationship with Jesus Christ. It was an underlying foundation of faith. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. What he was saying was there's only one God. What he was saying was that he is unified Hey, what you're saying was the Lord is my God. The Lord is my Savior. And, and, it, and it foreshadowed what Jesus would do for us. The Lord is our God. The Lord is one. And you shall love him with all your heart, soul, and mind. What is he saying there? He's saying this very simply, that it was more than listening. It was hearing and obeying. It was a foundational faith that trusted God. Now, you see, how this ties into what Jesus was saying is very interesting. He said, those that hear my words and do it are going to be like a wise man that builds his house on a rock. It's going to be a solid foundation. The floods are coming, the rain is coming, and it's going to stand. But he says, on the other hand, the one that hears my words and does not do it, in other words, doesn't have real faith. Now, now, let me me just pause and say this. My purpose is not to get you to doubt whether or not you have real faith. My purpose is to show you how to have real faith. I know that there are people that they get saved, they pray, and they trust Christ, and then they later, they're doubt because they sinned, because they did something they shouldn't have done, They're like, well, I must not be saved. And they pray all over again. That is not the point uh, that, that Jesus is making. He's not saying that you're going to be perfect. He's saying that your faith is going to be the kind of faith that I just talked about. Now, what did Jesus just talk about? Well, 
Let me give it to you in a nutshell. He began with the, what we call the Beatitudes. You know what the very first thing he said in this sermon was? It was like his opening illustration. It was his opening phrase. He said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The poor in spirit, they're going to go to heaven. Now, if we don't understand what he's meaning when he says this, we're like, oh, okay, these people that are humble, they're going, to be, they're going to go to heaven. Those that are just like, you know, very meek, they're going to go to heaven. That is not what he was saying at all. In fact, this word that was translated poor, it meant something that we don't really understand. The idea was that you were completely hopelessly broken, that you were completely without hope. You had no hope of living. You had no hope of your next meal. You had no hope of helping yourself. You were physically broken. You were physically incapable of helping yourself. And unless somebody else came and helped you on their behalf, they weren't going to make it. That's the mental picture we get of the word poor. Now, let's read what Jesus is saying. Blessed are the poor, not the physically broken, but the spiritually broken, those that understand that apart from God, apart from a relationship with God, apart from Jesus, apart from somebody else helping them, no matter how good they are, no matter how hard they try, no matter what they do, They're completely hopeless unless God shows up. Now, he goes on. He says, blessed are the poor in spirit. Then he talks about the meek. That means those who don't depend on themselves, but they depend on God. Uh, Blessed are those who mourn. Those are those that repent in faith. And those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. In other words, you know what the picture he was painting was? The person that puts faith in Jesus Christ. The person that gets saved. That's what we call it. Becoming a Christian. Following Christ. Crossing the line of faith. Being born again. No matter what terminology you want to use. What Jesus was showing us is that our wisdom, our wise choices, our foundation does not begin with us. It begins with Jesus, and it begins with a relationship with God. And apart from that relationship, everything you build your life on is like building on sand. It won't last. It won't work. There's no way that it can. Why? Because only those that acknowledge that they are not the rock, but that he is, Only those that acknowledge that I can try and I I can be moral and it's good for me to be good and it's good for me to do good things. We're not suggesting that you should be immoral, but you don't approach God that way. That's not the way to transformation. That's not the way to wisdom. That's not the foundation we build on. What do we build on? We build on our faith in what Jesus does, not in what we do. And so he, he, he goes on, and, and the interesting thing is in the Sermon on the Mount, this is, this is interesting. If you read the whole thing, he starts with salvation. And then do you know what he talks about after that? And, and I would encourage you this week to read Matthew 5 to 7. Read those three chapters. You will find the sermon that Jesus preached fascinating. Here is, in essence, what he talked about after salvation. He talked about using your influence. He talked about depending on his grace and not your works. He talked about dealing with anger, with lust, how to manage your relationships. He talked about having a forgiving spirit and forgiving those that have hurt you. He talked about uh, how that we can reconcile. He talked about honesty, revenge and retaliation, loving those that hurt you, giving and generosity, helping the poor, treating others the way you want to be treated, prayer, living for a purpose, worry, anxiety, money, materialism, not being judgmental. He talked about your work, your responsibility, and loving God. Wow, what a sermon. I'd say that just about covers it, wouldn't you? I mean, just about everything we face was covered in that sermon. Now, in light of what he said, you must ask yourself the question about your faith. He said, blessed are those, those that hear and do. Those that hear and obey. An authentic faith. The kind of faith that doesn't just stand on the cliff. It jumps off the cliff. 
And so he's saying this, that he is contrasting that which was wise and foolish. You know, in the Old Testament, this is another thing that he was doing. In the Old Testament, the wise were those that followed God. It's often throughout the book of Proverbs. You can read it, the wise and the foolish. Foolish could mean two things. It could mean uh, inexperienced. Um, the, the foolish it, as in they are naive, they don't have life experience yet. Well, you'd say that would be a, a foolish person because they don't know. But in most cases, the contrast between wise and foolish, particularly in the book of Proverbs, was between that person that put their faith in God and that person that put their faith in themselves. That person that did not follow God. So uh, what is he saying? Well, Let me read from Ezekiel 13, verse 10. It says, this will happen because these evil prophets deceive my people. Now, notice what uh, the prophet Ezekiel is saying here. He's saying that there were people that were deceived because of what they believed. Now, listen to this. He said, they deceive people by saying, all is peaceful when there is no peace at all. In other words, declaring that a way to be made right with God, other than God's way to be made right with God, he says... It's as if. This is important. He's given, a, he's given a metaphor here. It's as if the people have built a flimsy wall and these prophets are trying to reinforce it by covering it with whitewash. So in other words, they're not concerned about the foundation. They're not concerned about the building material. They're not concerned about the weakness of the wall. They just want it to look good. They're covering it with whitewash. Tell these whitewashers that their wall will soon fall down. A heavy rainstorm will undermine it. Great hailstones and mighty winds will knock it down. And when the wall falls, the people will cry out, what happened to your whitewash? You know, and I think the the challenge here is a very interesting one. What Jesus is doing here is, I think, very clear. He's saying, don't be a pretender. Don't be a person that whitewashes things. Don't be a fake. Be authentic. Be real. And if you want to be considered wise, then be that person that is wise in your faith, and you hear you have a particular kind of faith, the kind that does, the kind that not just hears, but it does. So that's the first word we see, uh, the word faith. Faith. Here's the second word I want you to get. And it's an important word. It's the word floods. In this story, Jesus is painting a picture. If you listen to my sermon that I just preached, if you listen to what I talked about in uh, coming to God, having a relationship with God, managing life itself, You're going to have faith, but what Jesus was saying is this, you're also going to have floods. Uh, Are you aware that sometimes life happens? (laughs) Isn't that true? We were talking about it backstage this morning. There are just times that life happens. And I realize that there are times when, and we were talking about some apologetics backstage. We were talking about those that because of let's say, for example, shootings that have happened recently in our country. It's out of hand. It's out of control. And no matter what your political beliefs are about gun control or uh, that that's not the issue, but that the issue is more that we have veered away from responsibility and accountability in this culture and that uh, people have rejected God in their life, whether wherever you are politically, what we know is this, that God is a loving God and he is in control. You know why we know that? Because if there is no God, listen closely, then there are no moral absolutes apart from God. uh, It is an argument that is really undefeatable that there is no good without a source of absolute perfection. Unless there is a source that everyone can point to and believe in and say that is the definition of holiness, righteousness, and what is good. If there is no God, there cannot be that definition. And therefore, it is impossible 
to say with any conviction or any logical support, it is impossible to say, oh, that shooting in that elementary school was wrong. If you don't believe there's a God, you cannot say that. It is not a sustainable argument because apart from God, there is no good. And it's all just one big evolutionary accident. And, and, and that it's all what people have made up. And, and there's nothing in this world that you can say, well, that is evil because there is no such thing as evil if there is no such thing as God and perfection and holiness. You see what I'm saying? And here's what Jesus wants us to see, that without faith, the floods in our life are going to overwhelm us. Life happens. I can't give you all the answers. I I know what I believe. I believe that God is in control. I believe that he never makes a mistake. I do not believe that God is the author of evil. And so those that ask that difficult question, and and it's a good question. If God is all loving and all powerful, then how can that be? Because how can an all loving God who knows everything let these things happen? Therefore, if he's not able to stop the evil, therefore he is not all powerful, therefore he is not God. And if he is all powerful and he's capable of stopping the evil, then how is it that he allows it to happen? Because an all loving God would not allow that to happen. Do you get the question? Okay. So the point is this. Apart from understanding, A, that we are finite, he is infinite, that apart from understanding that he is God and that he cannot do evil, and and this is the kicker, apart from understanding God's love, you cannot mentally wrestle that to the ground. You say, well, how how in the world can you say that a shooting um, is a result of God's love? I'm not saying that the shooting itself was a result of God's love. It did not come from God. What I'm saying is this. God so loved us that he gave us a free will. And he knew that his creation is only right and only blessed and only good in right relationship with him. And he knew that sin breaks that connection with God. It breaks that relationship with God. And therefore... All of us, you you want to talk about hell. I mean, think about the definition technically of hell is the absence of God and the absence of God's love. Think about this. Uh, Whether there's literal fire or not, I tend to believe that that, that fire is a metaphor for hell. But I believe hell is very real. I believe hell is a very real place. I believe hell is a very real existence. But I want you to think about this. What if your existence was completely absent of love. No love. None. Total selfishness. Total narcissism. Uh, No love of a child. No love of a spouse. No romantic love. No love of a family. No love of a parent. No love of a brother or sister. No love of a friend. What if there was no love? Because the Bible says God is love. What if it was an existence? Can you imagine the absolute torture of that? I can't even imagine it. What if there's no kindness? Not a bit. None. None whatsoever. Can you imagine that existence? And here's what God knows. That apart from his love and apart from our ability to come to him in right relationship with him, he knew that we didn't have the right to do it. We didn't have the ability to do it. We didn't have the strength to do it. That only he could do it. That's why Jesus died on the cross. And because of his great love, because he knew how wonderful it is and how incredible it is to be in relationship with God and how incredible life can be when we have love and kindness and joy. and ha- What if there's no joy, no happiness, none, completely absent? Can you imagine? The to- I would rather have physical fire than that. I can't imagine how incredibly painful that would be. But here's my point, and do not miss this. He knew that we could not have that if he did not give us a free will, the ability to choose. You can make a computer say, I love you, 
but it doesn't really love because it doesn't have the ability to say that, to choose that, to think that. And because of that, sin entered into the world. God didn't author it. God didn't do it. But everything bad that happens, don't lay it at the feet of God. Lay it at the feet of sin. Lay it at the feet that mankind chose this, not God. Okay? And that's the only way you can really begin to understand that. And I realize I veered off a little bit of what I was talking about. But floods, faith, floods. What am I saying? I'm simply saying this, that you're going to experience floods. Did you notice that it was the wise and the foolish that had floods and rain and storms? And the point is this that if you don't build your life on the foundation of the rock of Jesus Christ, (sighs) I I love what he said, great was the fall of it. Great was the fall of it. What if you build on sand? That's temporal things, like a career. Anything wrong with a career? No, you should have a career. The Bible says you should work. God, one of his beautiful commands before sin entered the world was that mankind have dominion over the world, over the earth. This is, a, this is a very insightful for us as human beings. The idea of inventing a better mousetrap, inventions, improving life, getting better, uh, climbing ladders of success, all that is a God-given innate thing that he put into us. It is an image of God thing. It is only when we allow our greed... Um, and our own selfishness and our own self-centeredness, that that becomes sinful. Is it a sin to have a career? No. Is it a sin to put your career before God? And, and this is what he's saying. Career, money, anything wrong with money? Well, money's not either good or bad. It's neutral. It's a tool. It's how you use it. It's how you desire it. It's what your relationship is with it. And if you build your life on money and career, guess what? That is shifting sand. I heard a pastor that had a person, he had a relationship with him, and uh, there was a, it's a Christian family, and they were billionaires, not millionaires, but billionaires with a B. And, you know, they were very generous people, they were godly people, they loved the Lord, but they had this one thing that they're connected, and it's, it's not that they were greedy. That wasn't it. Is that they never could get comfortable with the fact that no matter how much money they had, they could not plan for every contingency. And you know, that is true. Whether you make $500 a year or $500 million a year. The fact is, No matter what, Elon Musk cannot plan for every contingency in life. There are some things that could happen to him and his companies that would wipe out his wealth. That is not impossible. And so therefore, he could not plan for every contingency. And this Christian family, they were very wealthy. And one of their great fears was that they would not one day have enough. Now, before we judge them, oh, yeah, all these rich people, and we start throwing things around like, you know, insults about them, look in your own life. Are you afraid because of the economy, because of the job market, because that wages, real wages are going down because of inflation? Oh, I'm not saying that we shouldn't have any concerns or plans. I'm not saying that. But ask yourself the question, are you prepared for every contingency? What if you lost your job? What if you got kicked out of your house? What if your car broke down and you had no way of fixing it because you don't have the money to fix it and you can't get back and forth to work because you don't have a car? What if your kids come home one day and tell you, that they're going off and joining a rock band. Or that they're going to, you know, go live in a commune somewhere and, and, you know, free love, free drugs, and all this. 
Or even worse, what if they came home one day and said, I've become an Alabama fan. <laughs> God knows we need help. And, and, and don't miss this, okay? There is no such thing as a contingency for every flood in life. You build your life on money and relationships and prestige and self, it's going to fall. But he didn't just say it was going to fall a little bit. He didn't say you were almost going to make it. He said it was going to be a spectacular fall. And the point is this. When you build your life on works rather than your faith, when you build your life on anything other than Jesus Christ, listen, it's not that you're going to get down to the end of your life one day and they're going to say, boy, ooh, look at him. He almost made it to heaven. Nobody's going to say that. Because there is no such thing. It's kind of like what Jesus was giving an indication of, that uh, clothes doesn't count unless it's horseshoes and hand grenades. And, and, and his point is this. You will have a spectacular fall. Why? Well, because floods happen. And if you have no foundation, then the floods are going to rock your world and you won't recover. I've seen it happen to many, many Christians. Their foundation was not solid because they built on something other than Jesus Christ. And when the floods came, it devastated them. And they quit on God and they quit on church. I've even seen some people that have said, I gave up my faith. I don't know how you can give up that. But they said they stopped believing. That's one thing to stop going to church. It's another thing to completely deny a relationship with God. We well, say you cannot recover from that. Oh, I beg to differ. Uh, you ever heard of a man named Peter? We call him the Apostle Peter. Did you know that at Jesus' crucifixion three times, he didn't just deny that he knew him, he denied everything about him. Oh, by the way, that was the man that preached on the day of Pentecost when 3,000 people got saved. That was a man that God used in a mighty, mighty way. My point is this. It ain't about you. And even when we screw up, thank God, God is a God of second chances. And here's what I want you to understand. You and I will survive the floods. Sometimes we mess up. Sometimes we deny. Sometimes we say no when we say, should say yes. Sometimes we say yes when we should say no. Sometimes we screw up. But thank God, when my foundation is built on Jesus Christ, then the floods of life are not gonna overwhelm me. Now, I've gone a little longer than, than I had time for, but I am the boss, so I can make an executive decision uh, for, for all of our people that make plans. All right, so uh, l- let me give you this last thing, and I won't go through the whole thing. Let me give you the last word. It's the word foundation. And that all makes sense, right? Faith, floods, foundation. You see, it is the foundation that made the difference. He didn't even mention the building materials. How do we know what the house was made out of? Maybe it was like the three little pigs. Maybe it was a house made of straw. And when the wind came, that would blow that away. He didn't talk about the material that the house was built of. He talked about the material that the foundation was made of. And when we build on that, everything is going to be okay. And it's the foundation. Notice that the, found, the house rested on the foundation. What does that mean? we got to rest on Jesus, his grace, what he does, not our works. Notice that it's the object that, of our faith that matters. It's not the faith. It's not how little doubt you have in life. It's the object of your faith. You see, if the object of your faith is politics or your career or your image or prestige or success or your own ability then you've built on sand. But if the object of your faith is that immovable object of Jesus Christ, then everything is going to be okay. Psalm 62.6, He alone is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be greatly shaken. When Jesus is the foundation, you're not going to be greatly shaken. Oh, sometimes things discourage you. 
but it's not going to move you. The floods won't destroy you. Isaiah 28, 16, therefore, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Look, I am placing a foundation stone in Jerusalem, a firm and tested stone. It is a precious cornerstone that is safe to build on. And whoever believes need never be shaken. What does that mean? When you build on Jesus, he's the stone. He's the foundation. It's going to be okay. And then the last passage, I won't read the whole thing. But in Hebrews chapter 6, it tells us that when we trust in Jesus, his work, what he did, listen to what it says. It says this hope is a strong and trustworthy anchor for your soul. I don't want to mix up the metaphors here, foundation and anchor, but I think it's apt in this situation. What is the point? When you build your life on Jesus, when it's not built on sand... When it's faith that you have in him, when the floods of life come, you're going to be firm. Why? Because you've got the foundation. He says that Jesus is, that our hope in him is the hope that is the anchor of our soul. Why why is that a metaphor important? I think it's because of this. It's because of the job of an anchor. He said, what is the job of an anchor? Well, if you, maybe you're not familiar with boats and sailing and, and anchors and ships and all that kind of stuff, but here, here's what I know. When a captain of a ship casts out an anchor, you know what he does not tell the crew to do? Hold that anchor. Don't let it go. Put your back into it. Make sure that you're strong. Do you know why he does not do that? Because that is not the job of the crew that's on the boat. Do you know that all of the holding is the job of the anchor? And look, I realize that sometimes floods happen. But when you're built on that foundation of Jesus Christ, you don't have to hold on. You say, I feel like I'm losing my grip. doesn't matter because it's not your job to hold on. You know what Jesus' job is? If he's the anchor, he holds you. And therein lies the hope that we have. Therein, Jesus says, look, when you trust in me, when the floods come, You're going to have an anchor that does not give up. You're going to have a foundation that does not crumble. And you're going to be okay. Heavenly Father, help us today to believe that, to trust that, to acknowledge that, that you are our anchor. That you are our foundation and we can trust in you. I wonder if there's someone today that would say, Pastor, um, I need a foundation. I need Jesus. If you would pray to receive him today, you can pray something like this. I believe that you're the son of God. I believe you died on the cross and rose from the grave, and I'm asking you to save me. You can say that in the room or online. Online, click the button at the bottom of the screen in the room. Fill out the next step card. Let us know today that you pray to receive Christ. I hope you do if you're not sure of that foundation. But interestingly, the words that Jesus referred to, that Sermon on the Mount, the first part of it, the first part of it was about salvation. But the vast majority of that message was about your living for God, your relationship with him. And so the question is this, how are you in, with anxiety? How are you with work? How are you with that forgiving spirit? How are you handling the hurts of life? How are you handling greed? How are you handling loving your enemy? How are you handling all that? How are you handling anxiety and stress? Here's the thing. When you hear the words of Jesus, you can have that solid foundation. So I wonder if there'd be anyone that would say, Pastor, pray for me today because I've been a little shaky lately. Hadn't been handling all those things right, maybe. But I want you to pray for me that God would help me to build 
on that foundation of my faith in Jesus. Anybody like that today? Raise your hand. Raise your hand. God bless you. Heavenly Father, help us today to trust you, to love you, to believe through our faith that when the floods come, that our foundation is secure. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Thanks so much for joining us today on the Avalon Church YouTube channel. We hope the message you heard today encouraged you and strengthened you in your walk with Jesus wherever you are. If you know of someone that could use today's message, be sure to share it with a friend and also hit the subscribe button so you don't miss a single message. If you feel led today to give towards the mission and vision of Avalon Church, you can do so by clicking the give button on the screen. Thanks so much for joining us and we'll see you next time.